hear the word of God, I want to um, I want to read a, a prayer that I believe very much goes um, with our service of uh, communion, and it's from the uh, the Valley of Vision, uh, a book of Puritan prayers, and this is called the. Precious blood, the precious blood. Before thy cross, I kneel and see the heinousness of my sin, my iniquity that caused thee to be made a curse, the evil that excites the severity of divine wrath. Show me the enormity of my guilt by the crown of thorns, the pierced hands and feet the bruised body, the dying cries. Thy blood is the blood of incarnate God. Its worth infinite, its value beyond all thought. Infinite must be the evil and guilt that demands such a price. Sin is my malady, my monster, my foe, my viper, Born in my, de in my birth, alive in my life, strong in my character, dominating my faculties, following me as a shadow, intermingling with my every thought, my chain that holds me captive in the empire of my soul. Sinner that I am, why should the sun give me light, the air supply breath, the earth bear my tread, its fruits nourish me, its creatures subserve my ends, yet thy compassions yearn over me, thy heart hastens to my rescue, thy love endured my curse, thy mercy bore my deserved stripes, let me walk humbly in the lowest depths of humiliation, bathed in thy blood, tender of conscience, triumphing gloriously as an heir of salvation. Father, we, may we be tender of conscience, aware of the heinousness of our sin, and yet taking comfort and life in your sacrifice at the cross. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Just one verse of scripture. It's from 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 24. He bore our sins. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. That we having died to sins might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. As we come to celebrate communion today, this truth, above all others, should be burning in our hearts and our minds. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. The, the prayer that we prayed was formed by a man, a sinful man, redeemed man, centuries ago probably four, three or four hundred years ago at least. And yet when I read that, that prayer, I, th I thought with, with, with all our modern possibilities, all the improvements that we have in our daily life, do we pray like that? Have we improved on the prayers of those that have gone before us. I don't know whether you read anything 
more than 30 years old or whether you sing apart from in church anything more than 30 years old but um, I've been reading probably nothing more modern than books written at least 300 years ago in the last year almost apart from Lloyd-Jones of course um, and some good banner of truth literature but in the main I've been reading Puritans Owen Sibs, men like that, and I have to say that um, naively I believed at one time that uh, we would have, have improved their theology, we would have, have improved their understanding of God and I have to bow humbly and admit how wrong I was. I don't think they've ever been bettered. And uh, I think that um, it was simply because of their hearts. Because the things that are dearest to our hearts are generally the things most on our lips and most in our minds. I believe that where um, our heart is, that is where our treasure is. And we're, when we're speaking about the subjects that we have the greatest love for, we're not easily drawn away to other subjects. We become, in many ways, boring because we want to come back all the time to our subject. We want to come back all the time to what is in our heart, what drives us, what blesses us, what is important to us and we will politely listen to other people we'll even listen to other opinions but we will always be trying to get back to what is on our heart what we are breathing and living and uh, what is really important for us and as it is with us so it is with the apostles they continually wrote about the things closest to their hearts. Paul, John, uh, Peter, that we've read today. And when the apostles spoke and wrote of Christ suffering for us, they loved to dwell on it. They loved to dwell on the sufferings of Christ for us. Not because they enjoyed some form of, uh, of mournful uh, or, and, and not because they had some, um, you know, uh, strange um, uh, liking for blood and suffering, but simply because their hearts were stirred by Calvary, by the cross by the Christ of the cross. And when the apostles spoke and wrote of Christ and his suffering for us, they loved to dwell upon it. The apostles loved to present the sufferings of Christ as a comfort and as an encouragement for all Christians, particularly for suffering Christians persecuted Christians he came to bear our sins in his body on the tree Christ as we have sung today is our example our prophet, our priest our king and he is our sacrifice our life and our all in all our comfort and our salvation are found in this. He is the propitiation for our sins. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. He's our propitiation. The justice of God has been satisfied. The wrath of God that was over every single one of us has been not just lifted, but in its place 
is a glorified man and a glorified woman. His blood has not just forgiven us, it has transformed our hearts and our lives. As wretched sinners, I'm sure it would be enough if Christ had just died to forgive us. And that for all eternity we, we would be able to, to live. It would be a privilege instead of going to hell, instead of being eternally damned, instead of being banished from the side of God. It would be enough for us, I'm sure, just to be forgiven. And to enter heaven as a forgiven sinner. No more. But we are glorified. We have a future, an eternal future that God can't even describe to us at the moment. We simply wouldn't understand it and take it in. But we are forgiven sinners. But we are more than that. And this is the glory of it. This is the glory of the cross. It would be enough if we just entered forgiven sinners and, 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 and you know, we just lived as a forgiven sinner but, but we, will, we will live in glory we are sons of God we have been adopted by God as his sons and the, the, the more we understand our sin and the more we will understand our hearts I fear that many of us don't the more we will realise who God is I, I wrote a little bit on about the Friday Bible study and I, and I said, you know, how little I know of God. And someone just put a little emoji, wow. And what I meant was that I've spent so much of my Christian life thinking I knew God. But under that dreadful verse, you thought... I was such a one as you. And the more we understand the sinfulness of sin and the sinfulness of our own hearts, which really does require a great deal of study and, hum and humility, because I, I, you know, I, I kind of think we, we feel we're okay. Otherwise, it would surely be more tears and, 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 and more self, <laughs> not condemnation, but condemnation. We would be more like these great saints of the past who understood such a depravity of the human heart and yet in no way were they uh, discouraged because they saw how great God is and what he has done for us in Christ. You, please, if you get the chance, read Robert Murray McShane. He's my, probably my, my favourite example, but he, he may not be the best example, but he's my favourite example. Robert Murray McShane, a, a, a man who was probably as, as holy as the prophet Isaiah and, and yet just saw himself as a wretched sinner. We were under the sentence of death. Do we really understand that? We were under the sentence of death. Do we really understand you know, that we actually would have gone to hell? And, and, and you know, are we really interested? We were under the sentence of death. Death was necessary and an inseparable consequence of sin. Sin is death. Sin requires the death of the sinner. That, that is basic New, Test New Testament uh, truth as it is truly Old Testament teaching. Sin requires a sacrifice. The sinner must pay with his life. There are many mysteries in God. Many mysteries in the life that we live as a, a Christian. Many things that I do not understand. 
I do not understand even the doctrines that I believe and teach. I do not understand um, the sovereignty of God and the free will of man and, 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 and how it all comes together. But I will say this, and I've always said this, uh, if I have to err, I will err on the sovereignty of God. I would rather think, although it's impossible, I would rather think too much of God than too much of me. So I will always err on the sovereignty of God. So if you think I'm hard in, in my teaching uh, about God's sovereignty, it's because I really do not want to make the mistake of thinking that we are better than we are because we are wretched, filthy sinners deserving of hell. And, you know, and I'm, you know, I, I fear that that is just in many of us words that we believe, but it is not life that we, we live. We think we are better than we are. That is part of our sinful nature. That is part of the residue of sin that we still have. I actually think I'm better than I am. But there are many mysteries in life that I don't understand other than the sovereignty of God. Why can't God just forgive sin? Why couldn't he just, why can't God just, um, he's God, he's sovereign. I, I mean, I, I, you know, this is what I preach, the sovereignty of God. Why, why couldn't he just forgive us all? Please. Uh, why, why, why couldn't it just be that way? I don't understand. Why did Christ have to die for our sins? And we simply do not have all the answers. The only answers I have are contained in this word. And this word tells me that Christ died for the sins of the world. And I don't know why. And I shouldn't be surprised because I'm not God. I didn't plan all this. I didn't create the world. I didn't create you. I didn't create me. Um, and I don't even understand myself, let alone the deep things of God. We don't know all the answers, but God is sovereign. And in his sovereign will, God has decreed that justice and mercy meet in Jesus Christ. Justice and mercy meet in Jesus Christ. So we are to rejoice. We are to be of those who are most blessed and most happy on the face of this earth because we know that we are wretched sinners deserving of death and hell, yet we know that God has decreed, this God of ours has decreed, that justice and mercy meet in Jesus Christ. In Christ's death on the cross, God's justice is fully met. And our sin is not only forgiven, as I said, that would be enough. He's not just forgiven, but we have been raised to eternal glory with Jesus Christ. We've been raised with him. To live with him. Not just as a forgiven sinner. Because I think our heads would be even more drooped in heaven, but as glorified children of God. It's magnificent. The gospel is magnificent. It must be preached. It must be proclaimed. It must be lived. Because surely the, 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 this, this book is the gospel. And God has decreed justice and mercy they meet in Christ. In Christ's death on the cross, God's justice is fully met. That is why I can, I can at, at the same time say what wretched sinners we are, I am. And at the same time, but we are raised with Christ. We are God's people. The wrath of God has been taken away. And when God looks at us, he sees his children, his dear children, 
Joey was talking about the father's heart. Uh, you know, we, we, we have the father's heart. We have the father's pleasure. We have the father's uh, love. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. Is to declare and to, to reveal that love of the Father to us. And our sin is not only forgiven, but God's own co-eternal Son is given to us and for us. Consider what he is and what we are. Not just what we were, but what we are. Christ is the son of God's love, and we his enemies. At enmity with God. Without hope and without God in this world. Strangers to the covenants. We had no part, no portion. But God in his mercy, God in his love, stooped down. And met not just Jew, but ignorant Gentile. And we rejoice because we are his and he is ours. And we can say even more personally, you can say, he is mine. He's mine. Therefore, this forgiveness and mercy is expressed in his magnificent words, surely uh, the best known verse in the whole book. God so loved the world. God so loved the world. God's plan of salvation was decreed from eternity. There was a, never a time when it wasn't decree, decreed. Again, I'm proclaiming, I'm preaching and teaching things that I don't understand, but I can only preach them because they are in this book. That before anything was made, before there was a blade of grass, before there was a sun or a moon or a star, before there was any living creature, your name was written. In the book of life. You were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. It's a mystery. It's inexplainable. Uh, it is, uh, as we were looking at God on Friday, incomprehensible. But God has declared it in his word. That we are chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. God's plan of salvation was as I said, decreed from eternity. And all the work of Christ in salvation was accomplished in all points and agreed perfectly to this plan of redemption. And men and women are reconciled and saved. And Christ was perfectly fit for this work of redemption. There are so many truths just in this, this one um, statement. Christ is perfectly meek, perfectly prepared, the perfect sacrifice in God's plan of redemption because he is fully God, very God as, the, um, as our forefathers used to say. He is very God and he is very man. He's as human as you and I, but in a much more glorious way. He is very God and he is very man and these are mysteries so wonderful that we can proclaim them without understanding them as long as we are proclaiming this word I do not understand everything in this word but he was already fit to it by his deity and Godhead he is very God as I said but Christ is further fitted for the task by uniting the weakness of man to the almightiness of God in one being. The frailty of man to the power of God united. This perfect, united saviour. The suffering of the perfect one was crucial to our salvation. There had to be blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins. There had to be a man to pay the price of the sin of Adam. I ask that question, why wasn't there any other way? But when we read the word of God, we see that this is the perfect way. 
This perfectly answers to our problem. It perfectly answers to our sin. The suffering of the perfect one. Therefore, as his being the Son of God made him an acceptable sacrifice to God the Father, so his being the Son of Man made him suitable to man. And Christ our flesh. His body was framed in the womb of a virgin. As his being the Son of God made him an acceptable sacrifice to God the Father. So his being the Son of Man made him suitable to man. Born of a virgin. Taking our flesh from the same peace. He was born of a woman. And dare we say it, born of a sinful woman born of the Holy Spirit. His body framed, as I said, of the same piece of flesh as you and I. You know, I, I, I've been, been thinking that God could have made another man separate from us to be the saviour. God could have, God could have created another, uh, another man, another human being with the, the deity of the Son. He could have created, just as he created Adam, with, with, with you know innocent. So he could have created, uh, you know, to in a way to kind of separate from from sinful man. He could have made another human being, but not of Adam's race. But he didn't. He sent his son, born of a woman, and born under the law, to redeem us from the curse of the law and to redeem Gentiles who were not even um, under that privilege not even under that covenant he took our flesh born of a woman framed with the same piece of flesh as you and I no wonder we call him our nearest kinsman our redeemer our saviour And this Holy One was destined never to be tarnished by a single unworthy thought or word or deed. He bore our sins without bearing their power or being under the pollution of sin. And yet a perfect man, one of us, one of us, he bled for Adam's Helpless race, the hymn writer so beautifully says, he bled for Adam's helpless race. He who knew no sin could know no repentance and no regret and no guilt. He knew no sin. He was bore our sins. He was made sin for us. But we must we must always. Um, you know, we must always proclaim that in Christ there was never a repentance, never a regret, never any guilt. The very holiness, the very divinity of the Redeemer forbids any sinful weakness of any nature. And there are very, very famous and huge so-called Christian um, denominations and churches and mega churches who preach a dreadful um, different gospel but there was never any sinful weakness in our Lord our Lord could suffer hunger and did thirst weariness betrayal mocking anguish and even death but never remorse never regret Never sin. Even in Gethsemane when his soul was exceedingly sorrowful and on the cross when the cry of dereliction pierced even heaven itself. Our Lord could no more suffer a sinful thought, a guilty conscience, a selfish thought than he could speak falsehood or blasphemy. It was just impossible. 
because he is the sinless one. Therefore the scripture can declare he bore our sins in his own body. When we look at the cross we can see a disciple who betrayed him. We see malicious priests, we see corrupt rulers, we see a mob who shouted for his death by crucifixion. But we have been redeemed. We see more than that. We also see the cross as the Father's divine will and his counsel for the restoring of lost mankind. The cross for us is full of unspeakable mercy and grace, infinite wisdom and love in every part of it. The first Adam was created in the best of conditions, with the best of opportunities, in a world untainted by sin, in complete innocence. Yet he sin willfully led all mankind into the same condition of sin and rebellion. But the last Adam, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, came to this sin-sick world, to this world polluted, uh, to uh, a world full of human uh, beings, men and women, who were under the curse of the law, who were sinful. And he came to this world of greed and, 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 and shame and, 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 and corruption. Not the best of conditions. Not idle conditions for the last Adam to come. And yet he came. And he conquered. The last Adam. Our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, by his death, conveyed life to all of his own. He bore our sins. Christ was never, could never be displeasing to the Father. He bore the wrath of God, but he bore it for us and not for himself. He was never displeasing to the Father. In perfect obedience, he was the perfect sacrifice. As sinners, we were infinitely hateful to the holy God who hates and detests every measure of our iniquity. We were under God's wrath and we were under God's curse. But when Christ took the place of the sinner, he did not take any of the sinner's unholy traits. He didn't take any of our unholy ways. In Christ's own person, he was infinitely pure and it was necessary for him to be so in order to be the saviour there are certain things that had to be and we think of the cross and we think of him hanging on that cross and and at that moment our lord was never more pleasing to god he was never more righteous. He was never more acceptable to God. Never more intensely and immeasurably fulfilling the will of God than when he cried, Eli, Eli, lava, sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you created, uh, why have you forsaken me? At that moment, he, he was never more righteous, never more loved by the Father. The father who said, um, blessed be my son. And when we read, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We do not mean that there was any transfer of moral attributes or personal character. There was no transfer of our qualities, immoral qualities, you could say, for his perfect moral quality. When we, mean, when we say that he who knew no sin was made sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You know, this is a, a legal transaction that God has declared. But we mustn't take it any further than that and, and believe that there was some kind of, uh, of, of, of transfer of attributes, our immoral attributes for his great, perfect attributes. It's a great doctrine. 
the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. He was our substitute. But he did not substitute his perfect qualities, his attributes for our sin. The imputation of our sin to Christ and the imputation of his righteousness to the sinner does not release us from any responsibility for sin. Our sins must forever remain our sins. And Christ's perfections and holiness will always remain his own. The Lord Jesus Christ bore our nature. The word became flesh. Humanity uh, was necessary for Christ. Necessary in order that Christ should suffer, since as God he could not suffer, since as God he could not die. God cannot die. And when our Saviour died on the cross, it was his human nature which took the sting and drank the cup of suffering that he prophesied he would take. When we look at Christ bearing our sins, we should learn to look upon our sin with shame and and, and, and horror. If there was any true reason for us to forsake our sin, it is surely that Christ has died. How terrible that evil must be which demands such a sacrifice. You know, I spoke earlier that we, we think we're better than we are and we think our sins are not as bad as, uh, as they really are. We, we don't live in a reality with regard to ourselves. And with some of, some of us, there's a terrible lack of sanctification. Because when we think Christ has died, when we think of his sufferings, when we think of his sacrifice, when we think that this was what God had to do in order to redeem us, surely we must see how terrible that evil must be that demands that sacrifice that, that nothing else would have forgiven our sin you see God does nothing without infinite reason he is perfect reason and so he does nothing without a cause nothing without a reason and he would never sacrifice his dearly beloved son in such terrible pain and shame and inexpressible torment if there had been any other way to save the sinner so if we still think our sin isn't so bad we need to think again justice and full satisfaction demanded a blood sacrifice always did throughout the old testament and may I say, sin is not the trifle which we suppose it to be. That is thoughtless deception. Our sin, which we take so lightly, stung to death this glorious Redeemer when he met it as our sinless substitute. When we behold Christ bearing our sins, we should see it as the object of saving faith. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. The cross is the fulfillment of the promise. Look unto me and be ye saved, all ye ends of the earth. Come unto me. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Salvation is freely offered because of Christ, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we were healed. When we behold Christ bearing our sins, we have before us the greatest of all motives for personal holiness. A desire for personal holiness, a desire to, to walk that narrow way, a desire for separation uh, from the world, should not be some kind of grit our teeth sacrifice. 
Surely, when we behold Christ bearing our sin, hanging on the cross, we have before us the greatest of all motives to pursue personal holiness. If we are believers, we are crucified with Christ. His interests should be our interests. His spirit is ours. And God help us that we don't embrace the sins which drove the nails into his hands and pierced his innocent, holy and loving heart. In every stroke of the hammer, every stripe, every insult, every pang, every groan, every tear, and every drop of his all-precious blood, there is a plea not to yield to sin. And I speak to myself more than anybody else in this room, who himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. In the first two centuries of Christianity, in the early church, sins committed before baptism were considered serious but forgivable. But sins committed after baptism were considered grave and heinous. And in some cases, some of our early church fathers could lead to excommunication from the fellowship. And with some in very extreme ways, there was no way back. It was for life. Now, I'm not saying that I agree with that, because I don't. But we can see how seriously the early church took the sin, not just of the unbeliever, but the sin of the believer. And though it is gloriously true that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all known sin, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. That is true, yet it is the height of surely terrible ingratitude against the Son who died for us, and a grieving of the Holy Spirit that we claim to follow, to indulge in sin and evil, simply because we have access to the fountain of pardon. Simply because we know that his blood cleanses us from all sin um, is no reason to take sin lightly. And Paul, as if to, uh, uh, you know, to, to understand the accusation before it ever comes, said, God forbid, God forbid. The detestable nature of sin is brought home to our sensitive consciences at the cross. As we partake of the bread and wine today, let us remember him who bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. If we are taking communion today and, uh, you know, we, we have, a, uh, you know, we're to come to the throne of grace with, with boldness. We remember how sinful we are, but we do not leave it there. We also remember that the sacrifice is for us. That the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. But if we're taking communion today with sincerity and humility, but also with boldness, we will show by our hearts that the doctrine of gracious salvation gives no encouragement to sin. A tender fear of offending him who loved us unto death will make us, will help us to walk in holiness and sincerity as we remember our past sins. We will offer all we have and are to him by whose stripes we were healed. And so the appeal is that we, we remember our sins but we remember the cross even more. Where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. And so uh, the truth of the gospel, the truth of the cross, should in no way impede us from taking communion. But it should encourage us. Because he died.
for us so that we will live for him. Father, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for the mercy. Forgive us, Lord, if we take our own sin, even as believers, too lightly. But Lord, we know that you don't want us to wallow in some kind of guilt and shame because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that we are saved. Oh, Lord, we thank you that we are new creatures in Christ Jesus for all who have received the Lord Jesus as Lord and Saviour. As we approach the communion table, Lord, may we do it with great boldness, sincerity of heart, and humility as we realize, Lord, who we are and what we are today and what it costs you. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.